Hey everybody and welcome to the 5 Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. The podcast, as always, is brought to you by my sponsors, Goliath Technologies, who help IT pros be proactive and anticipate, troubleshoot, and prevent end-user experience issues regardless of where IT workloads or users are located. And also by Liquidware, creators of FlexApp, the most feature-rich application layering product on the market today. And brought to you by Policy Pack Software, where you use Group Policy RMDM to remove admin rights, manage and lock down applications, Java, browsers, and mitigate ransomware. Without my great sponsors, this podcast would not be possible. Now let's dive into some news. First off, a heads up. Bleepingcomputer.com has reported that KB4522016 breaks printing in Windows. Microsoft have stated, quote, the print spooler service may intermittently have issues completing a print job and may result in a print job being canceled or failing. Some apps may close or error when print spooler fails and you may receive a remote procedure call error, RPC error, from some printing utility or printing applications. And that's according to Microsoft via their Windows Release Health Dashboard. The issues appear to only happen in some printing utilities or printing apps and Typically, retrying the print job or restarting the device should allow users to successfully revive their printers, according to Microsoft. For some devices, a driver downgrade may also be useful for solving the printing problems. And a second heads up. If you took or are contemplating taking KB4524147, which is an out-of-band security update that was released together with the standalone IE cumulative update and is designed to address a printing issue that's been plaguing all support of Windows client and server versions. Well, unfortunately, this can cause start menu issues on Windows 10 version 1903. According to bleepingcomputer.com again, Microsoft says that they're currently unaware of any issues with this update but users have been reporting that their start menus broke after installing 4524147, as well as, unfortunately, still experiencing issues while trying to print using several printer models. Unfortunately, as Microsoft are not currently aware that this is a widespread problem, there is no planned fix in the works. Sticking with some Microsoft news, Microsoft have announced support for Office 365 Pro Plus for Windows Server 2019 customers with on-premises and Azure deployments. So hallelujah for that, because the future was looking pretty uncertain for RDSH, as it seemed like Office 365 would not be an option there. I bet this is a case of customers' voices being heard after what I'd imagine was a pretty heavy bitching session after the announcement that it would not be supported previously. Microsoft recommend taking the following steps as a best practice. Run Office 365 Pro Plus on Windows Server 2019. Leverage flexibility of Windows Server 2019 to implement single and multi-session capabilities. Deploy FS Logics to ensure smooth user profile roaming and end user experience at logon. And use OneDrive with the files on demand capabilities for optimized storage and retrieval of user files. So the more interesting best practices are the use of FS logics and the files on demand capabilities in OneDrive. If you've been paying attention to the podcast or even just trends within the industry since Microsoft bought FS logics, this wouldn't be all that surprising. FS logics by far and away with their Office 365 container had the best solution for Office 365 roaming. So it's no surprise that That's being recommended going forward as a profile container solution for addressing the Office 365 roaming issues. Interestingly, Microsoft also announced a new Disable Legacy TLS feature for Windows Server 2019 through update KB4490481. This Disable Legacy TLS feature allows an online or an on-premises web service 
to offer two distinct groupings of endpoints on the same hardware. One which allows only, say, TLS 1.2 plus or greater traffic, and another which accommodates legacy TLS 1.0 traffic. The changes are implemented in the HTTP.sys and in conjunction with the issuance of additional certificates, these allow traffic to be routed to the new endpoint with appropriate TLS versioning. They state that prior to this change, deploying such capabilities would require an additional hardware investment because such settings were only configurable system-wide via the registry. Uh, actually, I've been handling this use case pretty easily with AppV myself. I work in organizations which are obviously pretty security focused due to the nature of the industry that I currently work in. And they want to standardize on at least version 1.1 and 1.2 for now until 1.3 has reached maturity. So 1.0 is disabled in the baseline security policy. We have a couple of applications that still require TLS 1.0. And rather than having to allow 1.0 throughout the organization as a global setting, I use AppV and I capture on my sequencing machine, I start with 1.0 disabled, and then I simply just check that box in Internet Explorer for my application during the sequencing. And that will hold within the package and it will allow the application to run with TLS 1.0 while ensuring the baseline security policy remains the same and everyone else is just using 1.1 and 1.2 and only are ex exposed to that. I'll share a blog post with this episode in reference links, which is episode 93. You'll find those on 5bytespodcast.com under reference links, or you can find it in the description field within your podcast platform of choice. Opera version 64 has been released, and following in the footsteps of Mozilla with Firefox, it appears the focus of this release is very much on the privacy protection side of things. They claim to protect your data, preventing something you search for in, say, an online shop to follow you along to other sites in way of ads and content that's tailored to you. This tracker blocker can speed up web browsing by up to 20% by just cutting that out. It will be interesting to see how Google handles these types of features from vendors who make Chromium-based browsers like Opera it could potentially hurt their advertising revenue. The new version of Opera also comes with enhanced snapshot abilities for grabbing screenshots of things within your browser. It is also said to be pretty resource aware and efficient, ensuring it's not hogging all of your CPU and memory while doing things like streaming games. Tyler Leonard shared a little tidbit of information this week on Twitter. The next release of the PowerShell extension for Visual Code will bring with it some of the buttons that people may be using today in PowerShell ISE. I saw a discussion this week on Twitter with some friends stating they don't like using Visual Code for PowerShell scripting, so maybe these types of improvements will help lure those type of people back to using Visual Code. Personally, I agree. I don't like it all that much for you for doing PowerShell scripting. I do like it for reading things or editing things like JSON files and some other file types. So yeah, these types of enhancements for PowerShell are very welcome. If you listen to the podcast each week, you may recall several months ago I reported on a rumored Windows 10 Lite version. At the time, the article was posted by Mary Jo Foley at ZDNet. Well. Mary Jo was on hand again this week to report that this Windows 10 Lite is now going to be Windows 10 X that was announced and showcased during the widely covered Microsoft Surface event. From announcements, it seems that the Surface Neo, the dual screen Surface device that's due around the holiday season of 2020, will run Windows 10 X and any new dual screen and foldable Windows devices from their partners like Dell, Lenovo, HP, Asus, and others also will likely ship with this Windows 10 X. Interestingly, Mary Jo reports that the operating system will possibly only work on Intel processors, at least initially. It will also allow running Win32 apps, as you might expect with these types of processors, but reportedly these apps will run in containers. It's a little hard to tell what these containers will mean and what they are. 
It sounds a little like MSIX, but it's unclear to me at this time what it will run in. Perhaps this will feature app attached with MSIX. It would certainly make sense as I think the timeline adds up with what has been suggested publicly for app attach. Holiday of 2020 should be achievable for it if that is the underlying technology here for these containers. Good spot this week from Florin B, our Flobo09 on Twitter, which is fun to say, who shared a screenshot showing that the OneDrive desktop client installer is now delivered as an MSIX. This is a pretty big deal as this is the type of fate Microsoft never really showed with AppV. Their development teams did not embrace it, so hopefully this means good days lie ahead for MSIX. Michael Mardell shared a great article this week on some new key features to Azure Active Directory Connect that have been added into preview. These include an ability to force password resets at logon, which allows you much like in your on-premises AD today to force a user to change their password on login. And you'll be able to enforce cloud password policies for synced users, which ensures you no longer have the problem of setting a certain expiration date for users' accounts on-premises, and then it just doesn't apply in Azure. That will now sync within Azure. Michael suggests the preview is not perfect, but these types of features show promise, and the fact that Microsoft is working on greater priority is welcome. ZDNet reports that the FBI have issued a warning around SIM swapping, vulnerabilities in online pages handling multi-factor authentication operations, and the use of transparent proxies like Murane and Necro Browser, all of which make MFA possibly less secure than you may think. While the FBI still advises people to do use MFA, they want users of MFA solutions to be aware that cyber criminals now have ways around such account protections. I'll share this article too. There's a whole lot of examples of MFA being bypassed or breached. It's pretty eye-opening stuff. Speaking of MFA, Microsoft released a blog post titled, Your Password Doesn't Matter, MFA Does. As you might expect, the post gets into the positives of MFA and different examples of what you can use. This is not a surprising article as they've been beating this drum for a while now. But it is worth highlighting on the podcast as their efforts continue in trying to shift enterprise IT away from traditional password and password management. A new Linux kernel lockdown feature has been announced that will restrict even the elusive root account. ZDNet reports when enabled, this new lockdown feature will restrict some kernel functionality even for the root user, making it harder for compromised root accounts to compromise the rest of the operating system. The lockdown module is intended to allow for kernels to be locked down early in the boot process, said Matthew Garrett, the Google engineer who actually proposed the feature a few years back. The lockdown module will restrict access to kernel features that may allow arbitrary code execution via code supplied by user land processes, blocking processes from writing or reading, slash dev slash mem and slash dev slash kmem memory, block access to opening slash dev slash part to prevent raw part access, enforcing kernel module signatures and many more other features. The new module will support two lockdown modes, namely integrity and confidentiality mode. Each is unique and restricts access to different kernel functionality. If you set it to integrity mode, kernel features that allow user land and to modify running kernel are disabled. If set to confidentiality mode, kernel features that allow user land to extract confidential information from the kernel are also disabled. If necessary, additional lockdown modes can also be added on top, but this will require an external patch on top of the lockdown module. The feature will be available in Linux kernel version 5.4 branch, which is coming very soon. 
I cover a lot of news around microservices, Docker containers, Windows containers, Kubernetes, container security products, and that sort of thing. This week, Citrix CTO Christian O'Reilly shared a really interesting blog post by Alexandra Noonan at Segment.com, who talked about how microservices were a core piece of their product, but then things started to go wrong, and they had three full-time engineers dealing with some of its shortcomings. The post details how they went back to a monolith system and talks about the added benefits from doing so, as well as the negatives. It's a pretty interesting read. I'll share it with this episode. Uber Agent version 5.3 is here with some cool new features, including the ability to read and display custom company specific tags, such as say machine information you may store in the registry, or maybe region details that you store in environment variables. An improved load balancing algorithm chooses the next receiver server randomly. Previously, all endpoints switch to the same new server unnecessarily increasing the load on that server. So load balancing has been improved. Uber Agent now shows the distinct count of machines where an update is not installed. The single update inventory data table now includes hosts where a specific update is not installed. As you might expect, if you're an Uber Agent customer, you should consider upgrading as soon as you can. Did you know there is an SCCM extension for Windows Admin Center? It doesn't have full functionality just yet, but can add some functionality and visibility into your SCCM environment through the admin center. Version 1.1 has been released, and I'm sure more functionality will be added in the future. Following on from the recent release of Windows Virtual Desktop into general availability, there's been a lot of vendors releasing more details of their support for it. In my blog, I stated it was still a little unclear how vendors like Citrix and VMware will utilize and support it. They were pretty much just showing and demoing that you could launch a WVD session from Workspace or Workspace ONE. Not that I'm in some incredible visionary Oracle or Nostradamus type or anything, but in my blog, I talked about how the presentation layer, application delivery, and image management in WVD is a little weak right now. And from a recent blog post by Citrix, it looks like they noticed this too and seem to be angling for customers of WVD to use products like WEM for managing end user experience, including managing FSLogix profile containers and use app layering for some of the application management and image management purposes, as well as obviously virtual apps and desktops for published applications amongst other things. Sticking with WVD, last week I mentioned that ControlUp are a Microsoft partner on WVD for some of your management and monitoring needs. Well, Microsoft's Azure Academy this week published a video demo of WVD monitoring to show you just some of your options there too. I haven't used it or anything yet, but I would hazard a guess that it's probably not going to be as useful as using ControlUp. And also Microsoft's WVD program manager, Scott Manchester, tweeted this week, quote, Customers will be able to choose native WVD, WVD plus Citrix, which is Citrix Cloud or Essentials, or WVD plus VMware, which is Horizon on Azure. You get all the benefits and entitlements of WVD with any of these options. Welcome to the modern virtualization era, end quote. And that should tee up the next segment perfectly. It's the weekly webinar. Sticking with the WVD topic and other vendors supporting it, Citrix will be holding a webinar on the 10th of October, diving into some of the value they can bring for helping you manage and support your Windows virtual desktops. Together with Microsoft on the webinar, they will explore Windows Virtual Desktop and its implementation using Citrix Workspace by covering an overview of WVD, key Citrix integration steps, and deployment planning, including scalability data for multi-session Windows 10, Windows Server 2016, and Server 2019. That's going to be held Thursday, October 10th, with two showings, one at 9 a.m. Eastern and the other at 2 p.m. Eastern. And before I jump off of WVD, if you happen to be going to Ignite this year, you may want to check out session BRK2084, which will be a WVD-based session and promises some announcements around WVD enhancements. And now this week's scripts, tricks, and tips. 
A hot topic right now with the move to Windows 10 and Server 2016 or 2019 is the new start menu and how to tame the beast. James Rankin has posted a lot of amazing content around profile management and some around the start menu management in the past. He's now posted a blog complete with video demos on how you can use FSLogic's app masking to help manage your menus. I've done this myself and it is very, very simple. If you follow the video, you'll be able to do it too. And just a reminder, but pretty much everyone with a Microsoft Enterprise licensing now owns FSLogic. So you really got to check it out. It's some really cool, simple stuff and it's very powerful. On the script side, Guy Leach is featured here once again, but he shared a PowerShell script to show sleep, hibernate, and resume times, which could be useful for troubleshooting reports of, say, poor end user experience issues due to these events kicking in. You know, the classic, oh, I only left it on for five minutes BS, and it went to sleep. Well, this will let you see if that claim is really true or not. A different type of tip all together now from Rob Beekmans, who posted a blog about his hearing issues and his need for using hearing aids and how he handles that with a busy travel schedule. I'm lucky enough to not require this myself, but it's interesting to read some of the challenges like when doing public speaking events, using them with gadgets or listening to music or watching movies and that sort of thing. So if you have hearing loss, and you want to read someone else's perspective of how they deal with it, or maybe you've only just started to have hearing loss and you're worried about it and you know you should go in and get hearing aids and you want to hear from someone else who's gone through that and how they've adjusted to these different aspects of their job and their just general life, you should check out Rob's excellent blog post. And as always, I will share links to everything that I've discussed on this week's episode of the podcast on 5bytespodcast.com under reference links for episode 93. And that's it for another week. Thank you all so much for listening.